So in this new series, I'm going to teach this week. I'm going to bat lead off this week. Uh, next week, Pastor Elena will be preaching. She's going to be preaching. I said Pastor Elena's going to be preaching next week. She's going to bring it next week. She'll be talking about how to, she'll be talking about slaying your giant next week. And then I'll come back on the following week, which is Mother's Day. You know, Mother's Day is just two weeks away from today. So I'm, I'm going to preach on Mother's Day because mama shouldn't have to minister on the day that mama's supposed to be ministered to. So I'll come back and preach that day. As we get started this morning, though, uh, Gian texted this, he, he texted this to me um, not too long ago, a while back. And it's called, Never Argue With Children. It says, a little girl was talking to her teacher about whales. The teacher said it was physically impossible for a whale to swallow a human because even though it was a very large mammal, its throat was very small. The little girl stated that Jonah was swallowed by a whale. Irritated, the teacher reiterated that a whale could not swallow a human. It was physically impossible. The little girl said, when I get to heaven, I'll ask Jonah. The teacher asked, well, what if Jonah went to hell? The little girl replied, then you ask him. Never argue with children. Today as we start our new series, Championship Living, will you open your Bibles today to Joshua chapter 6. Joshua chapter 6. The Israelites have come out of Egypt. They've been released from 400 years of slavery. They've come through a miraculously split Red Sea only to see the Egyptian army drown in it. They enter the wilderness because God didn't just promise to take them out of Egypt. He promised to bring them into a land flowing with milk and honey. He promised to bring them into the promised land. So they come through the Red Sea under the leadership of Moses and into the wilderness, headed for Canaan, the promised land. But a journey that should have taken them approximately 40 days winds up taking them 40 years. Instead of crossing over, they camp in the wilderness and circle. They camp and circle for a total of 40 years. Moses dies at the age of 120. Joshua, his protege, is called by God to lead a new generation across the Jordan and into, the, in, into Canaan. The people sanctify themselves and the Lord splits the Jordan River just like he split the Red Sea. And the people enter into the promised land only to be greeted by a great walled city called Jericho. On the night prior to what we're going to read this morning, uh, on the night prior to engaging Jericho, we find Joshua by himself outside looking at those formidable enemy walls. Why? Why? Why is he out there the night before the first real battle? It's because Joshua had been at that same spot 40 years prior. He was one of the 12 spies that Moses sent out into Canaan to see if the land really was what God said it was. The 12 spies come back from that time of spying out the land with, with, with a, a cluster of grapes that's so huge and so ripe. They've got to take that cluster of grapes and drape it over a pole and have two men bring it and say, yeah, yeah, the land really is the way God said it was. But then 10 out of the 12 spies come back with a bad report, with an evil report, and they say, you know what? Yeah, but there's giants in that land behind the walls. There's giants. We're we're not well able to go in. We're not only, you know, like little, little grasshoppers in their eyes. We're like grasshoppers in our own eyes. We can't do it. We can't go up and take that land. The report from 10 out of the 12 spies, it ignites unbelief, doubt, dissent in the people. Only Joshua and Caleb have a spirit of faith. They, say, they quiet the people down and say, no, 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 we are well able to go up and take the land. Let us go in at once and take it. 
Only Joshua and Caleb come back with a good report, and it's amazing, but only Joshua and Caleb are left 40 years later. My family, if God says you can have something, you can have it. If God says you can do something, you can do it. If God says something is yours, it's yours. So that night, Joshua gazes at Jericho when he's approached by a man. In the New King James Bible, the, the word man is capitalized as it should be. In, in ancient Hebrew, it's the word ish. Ish was usually used for the word husband. He's a bridegroom. Ish was also the name given to Adam. This man, this capital M man, is also undoubtedly a warrior, and he's a warrior who has his sword drawn. How many of you know a warrior only draws his sword for one reason? Joshua confronts the warrior. Are you for us or for our adversaries? Because there can be no middle ground, no neutrality. Are you here to help us or, or are you here to help them? Are you, are you here to aid us in gaining victory over them or are you here to aid them in gaining victory over us? Which one? No neutrality, no middle ground, fight me or bow to me. And in Joshua chapter 5 and verse 14, it says, So he, with a capital H, so he said, No, but as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. Are you for us or for them? No. In essence, the commander of the army of the Lord, who is known throughout the Old Testament as the angel of the Lord, not an angel of the Lord, but the angel of the Lord, who is in fact none other than a pre-incarnate appearance of the Son of God. No wonder he's Ish. No wonder he's a bridegroom. No wonder he's the second Adam. He is a pre-incarnate appearance of the Son of God himself, this captain, this champion of our salvation. In essence, he's saying this, you're asking the wrong question. The, the, the issue is not whether I'm on your side. The issue is whether you're on my side. And there is no neutrality. There is no middle ground. Fight me or bow to me. Joshua, in essence, asks, are you here to help us take the city? God says that's the wrong question. It's like saying, you know, I'll serve you if you help me take that city, I'll, I'll serve you if you do for me what I need done. I'll serve you if you give me success, if you bolster my career, if you help me overcome this bad habit, if you prosper me. And what God is saying is, if you, I'll serve you if is not serving me at all. You're serving that and you're using me to get that, but I am holy. I have no equal. I have no rivals. The if is a rival. You are to bow to me unconditionally. My family, God does not exist to make your dreams come true. He is not your life coach helping you achieve your goals in life. Now, he will bless you, and he, he, he will be with you, and he will prosper you and give you good success, the Bible says, and he will bring you actually to heights that you could never get to on your own, but never forget that he is almighty God. He is holy, holy, holy. He is worthy, worthy, worthy. He is unmatched. He is unequaled. He is unrivaled. No one is on his level. He is perfect, and he is just, and he is righteous. He is good. He is pure. He's omniscient. He's omnipotent, he's omnipresent, and he is incomparable. The, the question is not whether he's on our side, but whether we're on his side. Joshua falls down in worship. Israelites did not worship human beings. Israelites, Israelites did not worship angels. They're, they are created beings. They only worship the creator. So Joshua now knows who he's standing in front of. And he falls down and he worships. The warrior accepts the worship and says, take off your sandals. 
The place that you're standing is holy ground. Honor my holiness. You, you cannot come into my presence with common footwear. Your, your sandals haven't been sanctified. You, they are not priestly, blood-sprinkled sandals. You can't come into my presence in common, unsanctified Nikes, Yeezys, or Jimmy Choo's. <laughs> Take those common sandals off. And honor the fact that I am altogether perfect and separate, that I am God and there is no other, that I am God all by myself. Joshua knows who he's talking to. He, he's heard about Moses' burning bush experience from Moses himself, and now he realizes that this is his. Joshua knows who this commander is. He knows who this warrior is. And now, and now Joshua realizes, okay, he's got a drawn sword. And he hasn't used it on me yet. So that means Joshua knows that with a holy God, there is no neutrality. So he comes to the correct conclusion. Okay, if he's not against me and I am for him, then he is for me. How many of you know the good news is that once you bow, once you unconditionally surrender, you find out that the warrior, the commander, the captain, the champion is actually for you. He always has your best interest at heart. If God is for us, who can be against us? Have you found Joshua 6? I'm going to read it today out of the NIV, the New International Version. Joshua chapter 6, I'm going to read verses 1 through 10, and then we're going to skip down to verse 20. It says, Now the gates of Jericho were securely barred because of the Israelites. No one went out and no one came in. Then the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have delivered Jericho into your hands, along with its king and its fighting men. March around the city once with all the armed men. Do this for six days. Have seven priests carry trumpets of ram's horns in front of the ark. Now, this wasn't the customary silver trumpets. These were the, the shofar. This was, these were the horns of jubilee. On the seventh day, march around the city seven times with the priests blowing the trumpets. When you hear the sound, a long blast on the trumpets, have the whole army give a loud shout. Then the wall of the city will collapse and the army will go up, everyone straight in. So Joshua, son of Nun, called the priests and said to them, take up the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord and have seven priests carry trumpets in front of it. And he ordered the army, advance, march around the city with an armed guard going ahead of the Ark of the Lord. When Joshua had spoken to the people, the seven priests carrying the seven trumpets before the Lord went forward, blowing their trumpets. And the Ark of the Lord's Covenant followed them. The armed guard marched ahead of the priests who blew the trumpets, and the rear guard followed the ark. All this time the trumpets were sounding, but Joshua had commanded the army, do not give a war cry, do not raise your voices, do not say a word until the day I tell you to shout, then shout. Skip down to verse 20, because now it's the seventh day. When the trumpets sounded, the army shouted, and the sound of the trumpet, when the men gave a loud shout, the wall collapsed. So everyone charged straight in, and they took the city. Circle the city in silence, and then shout. That is a crazy military strategy. But of course, this is not a story that's just about a military strategy. It's not even just a story about a military conquest. It's a story about much, much more. And as we saw at length not too long ago when we studied the book of Nehemiah, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. So our enemies are not always flesh and blood. And oftentimes when our enemies are flesh and blood, it's because non-flesh and blood enemies are prompting them to attack us. It's why Paul the apostle says both fight the good fight of faith and then he tells Timothy, wage good warfare. 
There's a lot of things that we sometimes have to fight through. Persecution, injustice, lies and personal attacks on our character, learned behaviors. We have to fight through depression, some of us. Anger, bitterness, offense, addictions of various kinds. The Bible calls those things strongholds. A stronghold is a fortress which is what an enemy-occupied, military-guarded, walled city in the Old Testament actually symbolizes, a stronghold. Jericho was the biggest and the baddest stronghold. It was the strongest fortress in Canaan, and it was the key to the whole country. My family, there are strongholds that once they are conquered, once your victory over it manifests, when those walls, by the grace of God, come down, it gloriously opens up everything else in your life. This is a battle against something that's been stopping you from having everything God says you can have and doing everything God said you could do and being everything God has destined you to be. Listen, Canaan is the promised land. It's the land where the promises come to pass. Canaan, by the express will and purpose of God, it belongs to Israel. But there's a fortress in it. There's an enemy force occupying what God has given them. So it's got to come down. It's got to fall. Amen. And there may be things in you. Enemy encampments, enemy fortresses, enemy footholds. You know, the Bible says that if you let the sun go down on your wrath, you can give the devil a foothold in your life. There may be strongholds, there may be footholds, there are enemy strongholds, and they've got to come down. Amen. That's what this battle represents. Now, there's endless stories in the Bible of different battles, different enemies. They're not all the same. There's different strategies, there's different tactics, there's different kinds of victory. And there are seasons in which God wants to teach us to war in different ways. In the Bible, there are times when massive armies engage until they are exhausted. You remember Joshua actually has to speak to the sun and, and tell it to stand still one day so that there can be a prolonged fight so that he can get the totality of the victory. Listen, we've all been in fights like that where we are worn out, where we are crispy critters, where we are exhausted, we feel exhausted, but at the same time, we know we've got to keep fighting. We get up day after day, we get our sword out, and it's just another battle, and another battle, and another battle. But listen, it's not just a battle, it winds up being a season of warfare. Some of you are in that battle right now. Some of you are in that battle for your kids right now. Some of you are in that battle to save your marriage or to save your family or your emotional well-being. You're in a prolonged battle for your sanity, for your peace. And you've been fighting for a prolonged season, but you know you got to keep on fighting. And then there's other battles, other kinds of battles in the scripture. For instance, there are battles in which God says, you know what, just do these three things. Do these three like unconventional, illogical, strange, weird things. And when you do them, your major breakthrough will happen. In each battle, victory came, but the battle looked different. There are battles that we are to engage in that we don't understand. And therefore we get frustrated because the battle that we're facing now is different from the battle we just faced. It's different from the last battle. It's different from the last 10 battles. See, when you're fighting, at least, you know, you have the scars to show that you're getting somewhere. When, you, when you're on the front line, you can at least say, okay, I killed three enemies today. When the enemy falls in front of you, at least you can see him. But then there is a battle in which you have to move. But it looks like nothing is changing. You're moving day after day after day, but nothing's changing. 
There's a battle where God requires you to act, to respond in certain ways, but he's not going to show you much, especially in comparison to what you've had to do. But it just seems like you're circling and circling and circling. Have you ever been, or maybe you are now, in a battle in which you're going round and round in circles? But know this today. There is a way to circle in which God teaches you and he trains you and he equips you and he builds you for your future and for the future of your children and your children's children. Listen, circling is not negative. It is entirely positive if you learn how to do it God's way. When God first gives this strategy to to Joshua, it's got to sound crazy. God says you'll circle once a day for six days and then on the seventh day, you'll circle seven times. So basically God says to him, here's the strategy, ready? Circle, 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 circle. And on the last day, circle, 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 circle. There's bad circling and there's good circling. The people that we're reading about today They are the children of bad circlers. Maybe your parents were bad circlers. They went round and round and round, and they never learned the lesson. They went round and round, and they never straightened out. They went round the same mountain over and over again. They repeated the same mistakes and they passed it on to you. It's all you've ever known. It's all you've ever seen. The Joshua generation came from a generation of awful circlers. Where God said, listen, you can go straight into this new land. And instead of getting there quickly, they'd gone around and around and around and around. You see, God chose this method of warfare to retrain them out of a bad habit from their past. Oh, I hope you get that today. I said God chose this method of warfare to retrain them out of a bad habit from their past. Bad circling. It's all they ever knew. It's what they grew up around. The environment was one of circling poorly. Going in circles and complaining in the wilderness. Going going in circles and whining. Going in circles and critiquing. Going in circles and mumbling and grumbling and griping. Going in circles of doubt and unbelief. Doing the same thing over and over and over again. And expecting somehow different results. Never breaking free. Never breaking out. Never breaking through. Just circling. And now God says, not only... Am I going to do a miracle for you of epic proportions, but in the miracle, I'm going to circle well. How many of you know that retrain you to unlearn learned behavior? Show you how to be addicted to Jesus. Listen carefully, there is a right way to circle your problem. And it is a skill that most people never learn. But God, through his word, is about to arm you today. You'll know how to thoroughly defeat your next Jericho. In Joshua chapter 6, again, all God's people know to this point, all they know is how to do it wrong. It's all they've ever seen. It's all that's ever been modeled to them. But through this miracle, the Lord is saying, if you will trust me, there are things you can circle in your family and in your marriage and in your relationships and in your life that will bring about victory that will be so sweet because you will know it was me. 
you'll know that only God could do that because this is a miracle that is not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. This is a miracle that is by grace through faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. I'll give you the strength to walk and not be weary. I'll give you the grace to circle your Jericho. And in the end, this will be me doing something for you that you could never do for yourself. Because some of you are literally living in deja vu. I mean, you get here every Sunday, and if we were to ask you, you'd say, listen, yeah, I've been putting one foot in front of the other all week, but nothing's changed. I've been busy all week. But in the things I really need a breakthrough, I don't see any difference. I've got a lot of activity, but no advancement. I'm moving, but I've got nothing to show for it. Listen, if that hits a little too close to home for you, take courage. Be of good cheer. Listen to me. Don't be too hard on yourself. Don't be too harsh on yourself. Ready? Don't be fooled by what you see. Amen. Don't be fooled by what you see. Just like a woman can be pregnant and not yet know it, change can be happening in you when you don't yet see it. You may not see God working here, but that does not mean that he's not working there. Listen to me. Listen to me. I want you to leave here today with a circling plan so that you come back next week, and when you come back, things in your life have shifted. Because with God, something's always happening. I said, with God, something's always happening. He's never distant. He's never detached. He's never dormant. He's never asleep. He's always working all things together for your good, and that's never not true. The Israelites needed to circle for seven days. In seven days, the walls were going to come down because they were going to learn how to circle well. And I believe that the key, the most important key to circling well, to seeing walls come down in your life, to seeing what has been trying to block you from seeing the promises of God flow in your life, the key to that coming, tumbling down, is found right in verse 2. Then the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have delivered Jericho into your hands. Say that with me. See, I have delivered Jericho into your hands. Say it one more time louder. See, I have delivered Jericho into your... There it is. There it is. That's the key. That's the key. God says, see, I have. See, I have. Not I might. Not I'm thinking about it. Not it's a possibility that I'm considering. It's not, it's not something. He's not saying, I'll put that under advisement. I'll, you know, I'll take that into consideration. I'm going to weigh out my options. That's not what he's saying. He's not even saying, well, if you're good. No, he's not saying if you're good. Not if you earn it. No, not if all the conditions are just right. Not if the wind is blowing in a certain direction. Not, he's not saying, well, if it's 72 degrees and mostly sunny. No, he said, see, I have. See what? The walls were still there. See what? Nothing's changed. See what? The circumstance was still very intimidating. The walls were high. The walls were thick. The walls were daunting. They were formidable. They, they'd been there for generations. They'd been there for a long time. And there are undoubtedly issues in your life that are intimidating. They're formidable. They may have been in your family for generations. Maybe for you it's been the inability to manage your finances. Never being able to save. Always trying to play catch up. Always, always behind. Always living paycheck to paycheck. Spending it before you have it. You're in debt up to your eyeballs. But it's all you've ever seen. It's all you know. It's going in circles. Maybe for you it's anger issues. Man, you snap into rage at the drop of a hat. Maybe, it's, maybe for you it's relationship issues. 
You, you don't know how to be in a relationship because you've never seen that modeled for you. You've never even seen a healthy one. And the enemy says to you, you know what? That's just the way you are. You think that's going to change with you? Sorry, it'll never change. You'll never change. You see, you've just hit a wall. And to that, God says, don't listen to that liar. I said, don't listen to that liar. God says, see, I have. Say it with me. See, I have. Say it again. See, I have. Please understand this, that there is a way to see that has nothing to do with your natural eyes. It's all about seeing with your spiritual understanding. You can actually overcome what you have seen with your physical eyes by learning to see with your spiritual eyes. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, the Bible tells us not to look at the things which are seen, but to look at the things which are unseen. And then the Bible tells us to, that we walk by faith, not by sight. You see, the greater miracle may be not the walls coming down, but what comes down in you. What you learn. Learning how to see in the unseen realm. Learning how to circle well. A lesson most people never learn. Most people spend their whole lives circling their problems in powerless frustration instead of with, with, with poise in faith. And when it comes to circling, it's all about seeing. Instead of seeing Jericho, see Jesus. Amen. Instead of seeing the wall, see the word. Amen. Instead of focusing on your problems, focus on the promise. Instead of being fearful of how big it is, listen to me, be faith-filled about how big your God is. Because God's saying, I've already done this. It's settled. It is finished. See it done, see it accomplished, see it finished. Listen, if you would see what God wants you to see, you would walk out of here completely different than the way you walked in here. You might have walked in here today empty, but you can leave here full. You might have walked in here today frustrated, but you can walk out of here free. You may have walked into here today heavy, but you can walk out of here with the weight of the world lifted off of your shoulders. See, I have. See, I have given you the victory already. See it. See what the Lord has done. See what he's already done. Listen to me. In light of Calvary, in light of new covenant realities, in light of after the cross realities, the Lord is saying this, I have already healed all of your diseases. I have already provided for you all things that pertain to life and godliness. I have already given you richly all things to enjoy. I have already shed my blood to forgive all of your iniquities and to make you brand new. I have already already paid the price for your deliverance. I have already gifted you righteousness, peace, and joy. I have already been broken so that you may be made whole. I know it doesn't look like it yet. I know the walls are still high. And everyone is in awe of Jericho's tremendous strength. But God is saying, I have already done this. Jericho's walls may be high, but I am higher. Jericho's walls may be strong, but I am stronger. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. I am a refuge and a fortress like no other. I have no rival. I have no equal. When I speak, galaxies come into existence. And God is saying, listen, I'm not pontificating. I'm not, I'm not deliberating. I'm not weighing the preponderance of the evidence. I have already decided. I have already acted. I have already won the victory for you. When you know that something is already done, your whole behavior changes. Right? I was thinking about this early this morning. Like, like, husbands, you'll feel me on this. 
but, but your wife comes to you and says, you know, dear, it's, uh, it's springtime. And the yard looks like a mess from winter. There's sticks all over the place. There's, I don't even know what's out there. You know, the bushes need to be trimmed back. You know, we've got to fertilize the lawn. We've got to do all that. There's a lot of yard work to do because spring is here. Amen. And husbands, you feel like, yes, dear. I just wanted to watch the NBA playoffs. <laughs> now, imagine, and you, you probably will have to use your imagination. This very rarely happens in reality. But, but imagine if your wife came to you and said, you know, honey, there's a lot of yard work that needs to be done. The yard looks kind of a mess. The bushes have to be trimmed back. The grass has to be fertilized. But you know what? Your boys got together on their own and they did it already. It's all done. The boys did it. It looks great out there. It looks wonderful. How many of you know it changes your whole demeanor to know it's already done? You're like, yes. Boy, I've trained my sons well, haven't I, right? <laughs> Changes your whole demeanor when you know something's already done. When you know something's already paid for, your, your whole behavior changes. When you know something is already taken care of, you stop saying half the things you've been saying. So here's how to do it. Ready? Circle the problem with the promise. Circle the problem with the promise. Probably better said, circle your problem with the promise. For you, the problem may be debt. The problem may be sickness. It may be a broken relationship. The problem may be unemployment or anxiety. Or you've believed some of the lies that mean-spirited people have spoken about you. And you now have no self-esteem or self-worth or self-respect. Your problem may be offense or bitterness or regret or shame. And, and, and listen, there, it, those things seem to have a way of trying to dominate our lives. right? It feels like those things are always present. And, and strikes fear in our hearts like a walled city. And even though we're in the and we're, we're saved, we're in, a, we're in a place where God, God, so they begin the circling process. When you begin to circle something, it's always there. Wherever you are, it's, it's always present. Every time you turn, it's there. It's at the dinner table. It's that person that reminds you of it. It's a comment that somebody says. It's always there. It's ever present. And you might have to walk around it for several days. You might have to walk around your Jericho for days. For some of us, we've been walking around our Jericho for several years. And when you walk around it, you have a choice. Courage or cowardice. Fear or faith. Here's how you do it in faith. Here's how you circle your problem in faith. You look right at it and you say this. I'm just circling you because you're about to fall down. And when you fall down, I'm walking right in. Right into the area you think you've been blocking from my life. I know right now you'd like me to look at you and be intimidated by you, but God said to circle you, not to worship you. God said to fear him and not you. God said to be in awe of him and not you. He didn't say to talk about you, to lift you up on a higher level than you are. He said to circle you. Listen, you can either do a defeated lap or you can do a victory lap. I said you can do a defeated lap or you can do a victory lap. The vast majority of people circle their problems in defeat. Uh, I don't know how much longer I can take this. Um, this is never going to change. This is just how it is. 
how are you? Okay, underneath it all. I don't, you know, I don't think this is, it's been too, I'm so stressed out. I'm so tired of all this. It's never going to change. You can do a defeated lap, or you can do a victory lap. Amen. A victory lap looks really different. Have you ever watched like a NASCAR thing where somebody wins, right, and they do a victory lap after they win the whatever 500, right? right? They get given the checkered flag, and they start to drive, and they take the checkered flag, and they wave it out the window, and they go around for another. They're driving. They're smiling. They're waving the victory flag, and then they pull into the infield where the grass is, and they start doing donuts, and the crowd is going crazy. Finally, somebody hands them a bottle of champagne. They're pouring champagne on their own head. Listen, you can do your lap around your problem like that. <laughs> Mumbling and grumbling, groaning and complaining, whining, pity party. <laughs> woe is me, woe is me. You can do it like that or you can pour champagne on your head. This is saying to yourself, Every day I will get up and I will walk in what God says my future will be. I will get up and I will walk around this problem in faith believing God. I will get up and I will walk around this problem very differently than the vast majority of other people. See, some of you have made Jericho Way more special than it needs to be. You, you, you've made it bigger than it should have ever been. You've added bricks to Jericho. You've added problems on top of your problems. Now you're nervous because you're nervous. You're worried that you're worried and you doubt that you're in faith. So you know what God says to do? Here's what God tells the Israelites to do as they circle Jericho and what he tells us to do as we circle ours ready. Don't say a word. Don't say a word. Don't make a noise. No war cries. Not a word until it's time to shout. Pastor Elena calls this the silence before the shout. Shut your mouth when God says to shut your mouth. Cállate la boca cuando Dios dice cállate la boca. Shut your mouth when God says to shut your mouth and shout when he tells you to shout. Because when God tells you to shout, I said when God tells you to shout, it will have within it the power to bring down walls. Until then, don't shout prematurely. Keep moving. Keep walking. Because something's about to come down. See, in the walking, God is working, and in the silence, something is shifting. Oh, say that with me today. In the walking, God is working. In the silence, something is shifting. When facing a wall, silence is the most powerful gift you can give to yourself. When you're going around a wall, it's not time for conversation. In the wilderness, they circled and the conversation started at the very first step. And lots of people chimed in. Misery loves company. They were grumbling and griping about what they didn't have, while what they did have was nothing less than miraculous. They began to murmur and complain and bellyache every step of the way. Did you know that the enemy doesn't know what's bothering you until you speak it? 
I said, the enemy doesn't know what's bothering you until you speak it. He can't read your mind. He's got no clue of what's going on inside of you until you tell him. And once he hears you, he says, oh, okay, I know you're weak. The best thing you could do is get up and say, today I walk around my Jericho with silent confidence in the God I serve. The scriptures say in quietness and in confidence shall be your strength. In quietness and in confidence shall be your strength. You know there was an entire year that Pastor Elaine and I stood on that verse. We were absolutely silent. We said no one to anything about our situation. We zipped it for an entire year and we kept saying to one another in quietness and in confidence shall be our strength. And I'm here to testify to you today at the end of a year, those walls came tumbling down. When facing a major impediment to your spiritual or your personal progress, the best thing you can do is get up in the morning and say silently to yourself today, as I walk around this thing that has obstructed me and tried to intimidate me and tried to block me from my destiny, I will meditate on the promises of my God. I will reflect on the goodness of my God. I will feed on the faithfulness of my God. I Listen to me. I will believe in the power of my God, but I cannot talk to you right now. I'm circling a Jericho. I cannot be distracted. I cannot talk about it. I cannot discuss this. I have to save all the strength of my vocal expression. I have to be reserved in silence because I'm about to shout. I'm not going to talk until it's time to shout. Some of us expend all our energy talking about our problems so we have nothing left to shout with. You, you've used all your words on things that make no difference. You've spoken idle words. The Bible calls it idle chatter, non-productive conversation, or worse, self-defeating, self-deflating self-talk. Silence. Silence is awkward. You're moving and nothing is changing. And when that happens, everything within you wants to cover the awkwardness. Nothing looks different than it did on day one, but it's day four. Nothing looks different than year one, and it's, it's year four. And so we want to say something to cover up what looks like failure. Th this wall was supposed to come down by now, and it hasn't budged. And so we make stuff up to make it sound better than it is. Because you, are, because you told everyone, you told everyone how God was going to come through for you. You did. You told everyone. You told everyone how he was going to provide. You told everyone how your career was going to take off. You told everyone how your business was going to bloom. And it hasn't yet. If that's you, you... You probably need to learn how to be quiet. How to tell no one. Nehemiah said, I told no one what God had put in my heart. Sometimes you got to tell no one. Because those people that you're telling, they're not going to help you anyway. They might even get jealous of your vision. They might, they, might, they might even sabotage you. They might smile and say, bless God to your face, but behind your back, they hope you fail. 
You might need to learn to keep quiet about certain things, keep certain things to yourself, things that are supposed to be just between you and God, things that are reserved for the secret place, things that you should, that should only be uttered in prayer. Listen to me, listen to me. With God, there is no awkward silence. There's no awkwardness in telling God, Lord, I don't see it. I, I don't see any movement. But I trust you. And I trust you enough to go around again. I trust you enough to circle this thing one more time or seven more times. I will save my voice for when it's time to shout. I will circle in silence. I will circle in faith. I will circle in obedience. Listen to me. Maybe this week is a week for you to be silent, to be still and know that he is God. God, I'm going to circle this intimidation. I'm going to circle this impediment. This thing that's trying to stop me and block me and shut me down. This thing that has not moved no matter how much I've been moving. I'm going to circle it in prayer. I'm going to circle it in meditation. I'm going to circle it in silence. I'm not going to talk about the problem and feed my frustration. I'm going to circle it with the promise and feed my faith. Listen to me, my family, when you do this, something on the inside of you will begin to roar. So, listen to me, the lion of Judah in you will begin to roar. The Holy Ghost growl in you will begin to form a holy enough is enough strength, enough, enough attitude, enough is enough spirit of faith will begin to bubble up on the inside of you. It'll begin to build. It'll begin to grow. And the day will come. God said it would. I said, and the day will come. It shall come to pass. The hour will come. And you'll know it by the Spirit of God. You'll know today is the day I shout. Today is the day my walls are coming down. Today is the day of my breakthrough. Today is, and didn't think that anything was shifting. But I believe that as the army circled for all that time, as they circled for those six days and then seven times on the seventh day, as they circled with their feet, as they walked by faith, and not by sight, I believe that every footstep was making a difference. Every step was loosening foundations. Even though nothing was changing above ground, everything was changing underground. Every time they took a step, God began to loosen a brick. Listen, but it wasn't until the seventh day that they saw it. The seventh day, the seventh day. It wasn't until the perfect day. It wasn't until the exact moment. It wasn't until the fullness of time. My family, you have not been circling for no reason. You've been circling for God's perfect timing. And all this time, when it looked like nothing was happening... Things have been happening. Not in the seen realm, but in the unseen realm. Foundations have been shaking. Whatever can be shaken has been shaken. The enemy's walls are not as strong as he thought they were. The enemy's blockage has been shaken and is about to collapse. Listen to me. You've been walking and God has been working. You've been circling and the enemy has been shaking. And you're going to walk right in and possess what is rightfully yours. Let me leave you with this. When you're, not, when you're on an airplane, when you're on a flight, and that flight is making its final approach to the destination, how many of you know sometimes as it's going down, it levels off? And it starts to circle. A holding pattern. Can I just be honest with you? I hate holding patterns. I hate them. 
Like especially when you're on a really, really long flight. And Pastor Elena will tell you this. If we're on a really long flight, if we're on an international flight and we're finally getting back, you know, you've been in the air 13 hours. or You've been in a tube in the sky for 13 hours, breathing everybody else's air. Yuck. And you're finally coming. It's like, it's like, yes, we're home. I love Newark. I love it when I just love I love Newark. I love it. And then all of a sudden, wham, you level off. And you start to circle. She will tell you, I will turn to her and say, oh, 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 no, no, no. No, we're not, we're not descending anymore. We're not descending. Look, there's the Manhattan skyline again. <laughs> and I'll get very, very frustrated. And I don't like it at all. But when you're in a holding pattern, know this. When you're circling what is to be your destination, but you're circling, were you to land just because you wanted to land, you would find that the runway might not be clear. You might wind up in a collision with another aircraft. Your life would be over Instead of kept safe while you're circling. You see, the pilot is not circling because he's bored. The pilot is not circling because he wants to do an extra few laps. He's circling because there is a time where it is safe to land. Your circling is not a waste of time. Your circling is not an exercise in futility. Your circling is not wandering in the wilderness. Your circling is about your safety. Your circling is about your security. Your circling is about your shalom. Your circling is about your peace, your prosperity, and your purpose. Your circling is about bringing down a stronghold, bringing down that which has been trying to block you, bringing down a wall at the exact right time. And my family, let me declare it to you today, in the name of Jesus, your wall is coming down. Your Jericho is coming down in Jesus' name. Oh, come on, everybody, stand on your feet with me.